buhay! It's me, your girl, Inday naman! Welcome back to my Taglish channel! Hello guys! How are you all on either side of the universe? So guys, for today, for tonight, we are going to um, explore and see the tales of the shipwreck coast dito pa rin sa Flagstaff Hill so we are going to see ang um, Flagstaff Hill kapag night time so for if, sorry for the race car <laughs> so we are going inside na guys let me show you <laughs> yeah when I was using it before it's um it doesn't like focus properly in darkness. Oops. Hey guys, so we have a ticket here. So one is for me, one is for girls. So we have pass one. So we are going to start at 8.45. Yeah, yeah see so the world's ugliest koala. This is <laughs> okay guys, we are on pass one. So the other one have pass two, so they will go there. G'day, the name's Bill Dutton. They called me Billy in the younger days. I used to hunt whales in the waters around these parts. Us whalers came and plundered until the whales we hunted were all but wiped out. And then we moved on. Well, I'm not me, I, I stayed put here. Before any white fellas like me set foot on this shore, there were Aboriginal people here. Been here since the dream time. They'd been here even as volcanoes belched with fire and churned up the earth and shaped the land. And they were here before boatloads of immigrants came from the far side of the world and put roots down here. And these new settlers farmed the land and traded on the coast. And before you knew it, little villages sprang up all along the coast. But these were treacherous waters, with unpredictable winds and currents and hidden rocks and reefs that could send a vessel and all on board to the depths of the ocean in the blink of an eye. This place very soon gained a terrible reputation as the Shipwreck Coast. There are many tales to tell about the Shipwreck Coast. Come along, I'll tell you some stories that you won't forget in a hurry. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, please make your way forward through the companion. G'day G'day there, so it's one per group. Thank you. Still pretty dud up the left hand side as well. Thank you. G'day guys. So one per group. Again, pretty dud up the left. Thanks guys, we'll just wait up ahead. Lantern. We have the uh, lantern. lantern. Yeah, so we can see our feet. Yeah. <laughs> There's no frog here. See? I had to turn off steady cam. I wasn't focusing. <laughs> yeah, they've joined up from the Thunders to Akalua. Village 
walkthrough is pretty typical of those that sprang up in the mid 1800s. Of course, they started off though, uh, just like you heard at the top there from Billy, with his sailors and uh, sorry, sailors and uh, whalers that came across just from Tasmania just to hunt the southern right whale. And of course, they were here for the exact same uh, whale season that we have today, coincidentally, obviously for very different reasons. Uh, but of course, this happened to be the winter months. So these are pretty rough men that took shelter of whatever sort of timber, stone, bark from tree put it all together and that really was their shelter for the coldest six months of the year. So pretty rough men and they really were just here for the one job and they did that job phenomenally well unfortunately. So the whale population dropped off rather uh, quickly, they obviously got bored, took off to deeper waters and they left the coastline for uh, all the settlers. And of course the settlers did come and uh, they started off with what they thought was the most important building first, at least in Warrnambool, and that was the pub. And of course <laughs> they expanded from there. Uh, if you're wondering, the second most important building is the church. So you drink one night, apologise the next day. Uh, but with that, we are definitely right on the shipwreck coast. And as I alluded to, is the, uh, at the top there, of course, travelling by sea was definitely the fastest way around. But it was definitely also the most dangerous. So along this coastline, uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of shipwrecks. Quite literally hundreds and hundreds where we can't even find the wreckage of it. So uh, it was really sort of scary around here. Not quite as bad as if you're travelling from Melbourne though. Uh, sorry, from England. So that trek would take you about three months. Of course, your Google Maps of the day is the sun and the stars, which works flawlessly all the time, except for when it's cloudy. And of course, all of your instruments need to be working flawlessly as well. So if your watch is out by one second a day, you're missing your mark by about 40 kilometres. So by the time you come on around this side, you sort of get caught in a bit of a storm. You can't quite tell exactly where you are. You're starting to get pretty nervous, knowing just how rough the coast is. Of course, all the uh, locals are all too aware of this, ready to take their off boats. And this leads me to my favorite building here, the Rocket House. I'd admit the building itself is boring as heck, but I love what they did. Again, mid 1800s, they would quite literally fire rockets over sinking ships to simply pull people back. It saved hundreds of lives around the world. I love how space age this would have been. And of course, we had a rocket crew in Warrnambool as well. We also had the wind though, so we'd fire the rockets and they'd just get blowing straight off course. <laughs> Having said that, we have at least saved a young family behind us in Lady Bay, including that of a young girl, so we'll sort of rest easy with that little victory. Um, but last thing I'll say is, I do genuinely love this place. If you are interested, come back during the day, everything's all open and uh, yeah, well yeah, you get to explore the, uh, of course how people used to live back then, a whole new world. But with that guys, if you're ready, let's go forward and take a seat. Sorry? I said you're just planning to catch me when I trip over, huh? Sorry? I said you're just planning to catch me when I trip over. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> nah, all good. Just, just, just share the link. I want to see it too. A uh, stupid question. What buildings are actually on place here? Because I saw... No, not stupid at all. That's a bit Because earlier on, I did see that some have got like a relocated and stuff. So yeah. what was actually, I guess, original uh, probably in place? So relocated is a funny word. Uh, the lighthouses were relocated 150 years ago. Oh, okay. So yeah. original or not. Um, but yeah, obviously, entirely the same big block reckon. Yeah. 150 years from now. Um, uh, so the buildings by the lighthouses at the very top. Yeah. I've been here ever since as well. Oh, obviously, okay. the flag staff. Yeah. Um, and most other buildings have been either relocated or completely rebuilt. Oh, okay. So the only one main building would be the jail. That was oh. uh, actually Croydon's jail. It's a bit and pieces, but it's mostly oh. recreated. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You got a front seat or? Yeah. This was a place born of fire. Oh, oh maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
oceans. And on the land. The Aborigines tell stories of how the land was created. At the start of the Yakin, or dreaming, Fermier, the great creator spirit, sent four creator beings to shape the different features that make our country. Now these beings, they weren't like you or me. No. They were giants. But they took on the shape of men and became the first lawmen who had special spiritual and ceremonial powers. To this day, their descendants perform special duties now, three of these original lawmen moved to other parts of the country, to the north and west. The fourth lawman stayed in this country, and when he crashed down, his giant body transformed into Tapok and Bush Bin, what the white fellas called Mount Napier and Mount Echoes. When Bush Bin erupted some 30,000 years ago, molten lava and stone rained across the land. With this mighty eruption, my people, the Gunishmara, witnessed the Creator being reveal himself. Today, you can still see evidence of the great Creator being all across the land. The scorious stones that are scattered across the country, <laughs> they're his teeth. And as you walk through this country, the country of the Gunishmara, look, listen. You can still hear his spirit. <laughs> when the Aborigines first saw the tall masts of sailing ships, they lit fires right along the coast to signal to other clans that there were new arrivals coming. The new arrivals were sealers and whalers. If I say so myself. They were hard and ruthless men, not to be trifled with. Well, at first, the Aborigines welcomed them. And what did they do in return? They went to war with them, that's what. But spears and clubs were no match for the whalers, muskets and gunpowder. And the Aborigines were either killed or driven from their country. It was a sorry business. Whalers had come here to plunder these giant beasts and nothing was going to deter them. I should know, I was one of them. And why were we here hunting whales on this isolated, godforsaken coastline? To feed the insatiable demand for whale oil and whale bone on the other side of the world. That's why. to produce goods on an unimaginable scale. Goods were traded around the world, and in return, exotic goods from the far corners of the globe were imported. If you were part of the middle class, it was a time of plenty, and a cornucopia of goods from all over the world could be purchased at one of the latest innovations, the department store. In the glittering surrounding of Harrods can be found practically anything from almost anywhere in the world. 
ivory boots from the Orient, ebony from darkest Africa, sandwich glass from Massachusetts, coffee from Brazil, porcelain from the Orient. Of all the products available to the well-to-do in the Victorian age, one of the most indispensable was whale oil. Its superior lubricating qualities made whale oil the ideal product to keep industrial steam engines operating. But whale oil was also used on the domestic front. Whale oil lamps lit up the homes of the wealthy and fashionable. It provided a brighter light than other animal fats available and produced far less smoke. Whale oil was extensively used in toiletries, cosmetics, and soaps. While whale oil was highly prized, whale bone too was a much sought after product. In many ways, whale bone was the plastic of its day. It was strong and flexible and could be put to numerous uses. Whale bone was used to make buggy whips as well as the springs on which the carriages rode. It was used to make brushes, combs, the ribs for parasols and umbrellas and fishing rods. But it was in women's fashion that whalebone made the greatest impression. To complete the ensemble, voluminous skirts supported by hoops of whalebone were all the rage in fashionable society. Whalebone and oil were luxury products, but the fashions and technology of the day meant there was a ready market willing to pay a premium for them. When I think about those fancy ladies and gents who lived in their fine houses in their big cities across the other side of the world, uh, little did they give a thought to where their whalebone and oil came from. Now, to be fair, before the whale men came to Devonport Town, I'd never have given it a second thought either. But the whaling boss did come, and he offered us jobs that would make us all our fortunes. still remember the night like it was yesterday. Strong enough to pull an oar, not afraid of a bit of hard work. What's the wages like, boss? I'll pay better than you'll get labouring in town or on a farm. Ah, I hear that whaling's a mug's game. Not a bit of it. <laughs> you'll be going after rights. They call them that because they come right in the shore. They're slow and when they're dead they float and they produce plenty of oil. So that makes them just right for hunting. So, who's interested? Oil, 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 oil. Drinks all round, barkeep. And I want to see all you lads on the foreshore tomorrow. How long will you be away, Billy? The boss said about 25 weeks, Mum. Depending on how many whales we find. He said it was like herding sheep. Oh, do be careful, son. I will, Mum, I will. That was how I got started in the whaling business. And before too long, I was boss of my own whaleboat crew and in charge of the harpoon and lancers. Uh, we were dumped on a barren shore, just a little way from here, as a matter of fact. And for months, we put up with bitter winds and with drenching, freezing rain that soaked you through the very matter. Oh. And then we waited. And waited. 
and waited some more, while our lookout up on the cliff scanned the horizon. I was just a lad, in truth. I didn't know what to expect, but I was soon to find out it was nothing like herding sheep. Station. Your eyes built, lads. Easy, boys. She's gone. I think we've lost her.
This one got away. But most didn't. Mostly we got our quarry. There was nothing like herding ship. We got a lot of whales and they lost a good number of crewmates along the way. Uh, in no time at all, we'd all but wiped out the whales around here. And when there were no more whales to be had, we traded our little boats for big ships and moved on to fresh hunting grounds in the frozen oceans of the south. But the truth was that our days were numbered. Fashion and times were changing. Steel replaced the whaleboat in the ladies' courses. Kerosene and mineral oil were used instead of whale oil for light lamps and to lubricate steam engines. Uh, Whalebone and oil had had their day. <sighs> and whalers like me had had their day too. See that old bloke in the corner? He reckons he used to hunt whales out in the bay here. Yeah? <laughs> to be off with you? He's pulling your leg! When was the last time you saw a whale in these waters? Yeah, now that you mention it, can't say that I have. But well, that's what I mean. Suppose you're right. Of course I am. I don't go in the silly old coot any mind. But times were changing. In Britain, steam engines and factories were taking the place of farming and cottage industries. The Industrial Revolution, they were calling it. It's making some people very rich, but it's bringing great poverty too. People swarmed to the crowded, smoggy cities in search of work. But all they find is unemployment, crime, and the constant threat of disease. For many, there is no escaping this degradation. But for others, there's the prospect of immigrating to a new life in a new land. Australia beckons. is prosperous. It's a land where gold has brought untold wealth to the colonies, especially Victoria, where millions of merino sheep produce some of the world's finest wool that is exported to the world, and where fields of wheat stretch to the horizons. By any reckoning, Australia is a land of opportunity. Melbourne, with its gleaming new buildings and wide boulevards, is busy organizing an international exhibition like those of Europe, which promote the best in agriculture, industry, and science. For some, the prospect of a new life in Australia beckons, but a voyage of 90 days to the other side of the earth is not for the faint-hearted. It is a journey fraught with hazard and hardship
the young women came first. The married women and their children followed. The men looked dark and stern, like men who knew they were about to confront danger. Each person has two canvas bags given them, and we are told to put a month's clothes into them, as all the boxes are to be put into the hold of the vessel today, and only to be taken out once a month to get another month's clothes and put our dirty ones away. For decent married people to be herded together like beasts, with almost no privacy to dress or undress, and where, in the close and stuffy bunks they slept in, only a thin board separated each couple from another alongside, another below, and another lot end to end. With the cargo and passengers loaded, we're ready to set sail. The whole mass of canvas, ropes and blocks is banging, flapping and rattling amongst the spars and rigging as the ship comes upright and heads to wind. Out of port and under sail, the cramped conditions are made all the more vile when the weather turns. Oh Lord, you should have heard the praying. No one slept a wink as the ship rolled, heaved and ground from one to the other. And as the captain bellowed his orders, we trembled for ourselves and for those poor men high up in the yards, balancing precariously above the treacherous seas. A fine young man, one of the sailors, was washed out of the rigging. It is so dreadful to think he cried out three times for the life boy to be thrown to him. human wretchedness could be much greater than was to be found in the close dark between decks of an outward bound immigrant ship. All ships' voyages were different, but all faced storms, seasickness, bad food, danger, and disease. I was awakened this morning by a poor woman laying her trembling hand on my shoulder, saying, Will you come, ma'am? My baby is dead. I went with her and prepared the little one for its watery grave. She bore up bravely, but broke down terribly after the funeral. That makes two within 24 hours. We enter the tropics today, so for the next three weeks or so, we may expect very hot weather. It is so hot that we are loath to go to bed. We do go about 10 o'clock. We lay and toss about for hours, that clothes dripping wet with perspiration. The immigrants no sooner acclimatize to the heat of the tropics before the cold of the Antarctic descends upon them to chill them to the bone. This was no inhabitant of the sea, 
but bore the olive branch of the land. On opening the scuttle in my cabin, I perceived an aromatic odour, as of spicy flowers. I met a gentleman who said, come on deck and smell the land. And there it was, strong and delicious. After close to three months, we were at last within sight of land and our salvation. So close to their destination, but still, ships now had to navigate their way into perilous Bass's Strait. It's like threading the eye of the needle. One such ship is the Lockhart. Alas, incessant cloud cover has prevented Lockhart's captain from getting true bearings. Ah, the Lockhart. Now there's a tale to be told. Not for nothing is this stretch of shore called the Shipwreck Coast. It's been the graveyard of many a fine vessel and countless numbers of sailors and passengers. As fine a ship as the Lockhart was, she was still at the mercy of nature at her most unforgiving. And true, she had an able captain. I am Captain George Gibb, master of the clipper ship Lockhart. 29 years and married just six weeks when we commenced our voyage. She had a capable and dedicated crew. I am Tom Pierce, 19 years, apprentice seaman on Lockhart. And she carried but a few passengers. I am Eva Carmichael, 19 years, passenger on the ship Lockhart. We carry everything. People, iron roofing, whiskey, tin goods, even a magnificent pottery peacock as high as a man, entrusted to my care and destined for the Royal Exhibition in Melbourne. But we were mostly carrying cargo. We had just 17 passengers on board and all were well cared for. My father was a doctor in Dublin, migrating to Australia because of his poor health. He, my mother, and two of my brothers and three of my sisters would all start a new life in Queensland. My whole life sailed on Lockhart. And so too did many lives sail on the Lockhart on that fateful night. if it blows up a buster. I pity any poor wretches out on the water on a night such as this. We've lost too many souls in this godforsaken shore. I swear I can hear some of them at night when the wind picks up. That's just your mind playing tricks. Well, maybe it is and maybe it ain't. Still, there'll be no mercy for any vessel out in this weather. Well, you're not wrong there. Not on a night like this.
good lord, how's the man meant to get a bearing? Beseech thee to intercede on behalf of the souls of those who are about to die. If you should be spared ever to see my dear wife, tell her. Tell her that I stood to my ship to the last and went down with her like a sailor. sail to safe harbor. Our voyage has reached its tragic end. Sailors who hope for no more than a few days ashore in Melbourne, while the lock out is being loaded for its long passage back to England, will sail no more. Passengers, filled with hope for new lives in a new land, will never get to live those lives. Those excited to be meet again with loved ones who had come out before them will never be reunited. It is not to be. Our gallant vessel has been dashed here on the ship that crossed, and so many lives along with it. 
It is not to be. of graves, thousands of souls, and now this coast of shipwrecks have claimed the mother, our Rocco, and all of our shipmates, the Steve Akama, and me, Tom Pierce, were the only two to survive. What became of Miss Eve of Carmichael and young Tom Pierce? Battling the heavy seas, Tom dragged Eva to shore and found shelter for them both in a cave. When he recovered enough strength, Tom managed to scale the sheer cliffs of the gorge to raise the alarm of the wreck of Lockhart and of his and Eva's survivors. with awards and money. There was talk that Tom and Eva were sweethearts, but that was mere gossip. Once Eva was well enough to travel, she returned to Ireland. Tom was dockside to wave her off. It was the last time they would ever see each other. survivor the night the Lockhart was sunk. The giant pottery peacock destined for the great exhibition in Melbourne. By some miracle, it was salvaged almost intact. just another amazing tale from the shipwreck coast. A story of fiery volcanic eruptions, a new life of the first peoples to tread this land. Of shipwrecks, of ghosts, of 
heroism and survival and of man's battle against the monsters of the deep. Bulaga. So we are done now. Oh, you can actually save your one. Yeah. <laughs> we are done our uh, tales of the shipwreck coach. So, yes. So, how was it, Jax? Uh, it was good. Uh, it was yeah, really good. You yeah. like it? Yeah, well, I guess the over laser shows, I guess like, the special effects, and I guess the storytelling as well. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it's highly recommended, guys, if you will go to Warnabo. Very nice. Now we need to go home now because I think it's around past nine something. So, later again, guys. So, that's it, guys. That's our Vlogstop Hill Maritime Museum and Village nighttime tour, guys. So, we watch the Tales of the Shipwreck Coast na nakita nyo kanina. Very musical. Maganda, guys. So, we will ask Jax. Kano yung experience ni Jax? Doon sa ating uh, Warnable Vlogstop Hill. So, Jax, how's your experience? <laughs> um, it was extra good. Extra good? <laughs> yeah, it was a good experience. Um, we, as you can probably see from the video, we started at the top of a visitor center, walked our way down through the darkness. We had um, like LED lanterns. It went down to the water's edge, sat in the stadium seating. And then, yeah, we watched the... Uh, it was kind of like a laser show. Um, I don't know if you say it's 3D. Sound and light. Yeah, it's sound and light. I mean, it's not 4D or 3D. It kind of is because you don't get hit by the water, but there's like special effects, let's say. So it was the, there was like a water spray, which they projected onto. And then there was also like, it must have had uh, rain and wind outside because there was like um, rain and wind like going across the front of the seating. You were getting wet, but it went there. Um, they like flowed in front of the, like I said, building we were in. And then they had the projection screen that also came down from the roof, which I think came down about twice as well. So yeah, all in all, I think we were for about half an hour in terms of like the individual, like actual show, and then followed by, I guess, the walking up and down as well. There was an introduction video, I think, when we were at the top, in the, just as we got outside the visitor center, I think where that ramp was. There was a sort of a bit of history there. But yeah, it was a good experience because um, we were there during the same day. I think we got there about two o'clock I think in the afternoon to see the daytime area and then we went back I think it was about eight the seven thirty eight o'clock I think it was. Yeah. Or maybe but even eight thirty I can't remember. Daylight saving too. Yeah maybe an eight thirty when we had to go back there because it obviously had to be dark so it was pretty late. Um but yeah all in all it was a good um good show. as you might be able to tell what footage I was the one who actually re recorded it so um I was holding the camera up and yeah, so I saw, I saw most of it, probably through the lens of the camera. But yeah, no, it, was, it was a good show. It's sort of quite unique. Ayan. So, 
thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed my little spill. Yep. Bulaga! So, ayun na nga guys. Nakita nyo yung sinabi ni Jax. Yung experience si Jax. This is our uh, tickets. So, eto yung tickets. So, if you purchase uh, daytime and the nighttime, you will have like 30% off for your day when you purchase the night show. So, eto siya. Ganito siya kalapad. So, kinukol nila. There's a pass 2 and pass 1. So, pass 1 will be like the first one who will walk. Uh inside. So, ayun na nga guys. So, ilalagay ko somewhere here yung uh, tickets prices dito sa side na to. The day, the night show and the day and night package. So, if you have a relatives na nandito sa Australia, you have relatives, colleagues, family, friends. And I do, we do highly recommend to go to the Flagstaff Hill, especially the night time. They also have uh, different time changes when it comes to daylight saving. So you will uh, know that too. And I will put their socials in my description box down below and you can check them out. So that's the end of our Flagstaff Hill Maritime Museum and Village Nighttime Tour. The Tales of the Shipwreck Coast for today's video. Masyado na siya mahaba guys. Paiksi na natin. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you had fun. Thank you for staying. Thank you for supporting my videos. And mega love shout out to each wonderful people of the universe. Thank you from the bottom of my high bow talamus. Please like if you did enjoy my video for today. And please do subscribe if you haven't yet. And don't forget to hit the bell button for you to get notified yeah. on my next video and peace comment down below yeah. if you like this video pa and see you when i see you on my next one bye bye guys be good you take care be safe and ciao